that's what you want because that see, see for me that's what inflates home prices is nick uh tell me like what what exactly it is you are you i know you're an investor are you also an agent yeah i've been an agent for five and a half years uh two up here in north carolina and then three down there in florida um but not nothing crazy. It's been like twelve to twenty per year. I'm not. I'm not in it. I'm not in it for the the forty or the eighty uh, yearly. So uh, it's usually two, one to two a month, and knock them out. So are you in it more so for the investing side? Is that what you're? I, I am. In, so I oops my way into real estate as an investor in the Navy, uh, buying a short sale, and I was like, wait a minute, this scales everywhere, and that's all. That's all I've done. So everything I've done has been live and flip. Are you flipping all over the country or just no, in your- No, no, no. So I, I, I wholesale all over the country, but okay. I, I've, the only things I've flipped have been houses I've lived in. Got you. Um, so wholesaling and flipping. Cool. And you're yeah. in North Carolina? I'm in uh, North Miami. I'm, North I'm just Miami. south of you, um, but I'm in North Carolina. My wife and kids live up here. I make oh, Miami okay. money and we, we have a $1,100 mortgage up here in North Carolina. Life's good. Got you, man. <laughs> Joel. And how, how long have you been selling? I know you're an agent. My 10th year. Okay. Broker associate. Sweet, sweet. And what, what's your, you know, yearly volume? Uh, I, I think I did 14 million a uh, year before last or last year. And then, uh, you know, this year probably be, be eight to 10. Gotcha. Um, again, same kind of method. I'm, I'm uh, pretty independent. I'll do two to three a month. Um, you know, average 20, 25 a year. Um, and my, my broker is a hundred percent commission, uh, broker. So I've, you know, with $200 a month out of pocket to work for him. So sounds expensive, pretty, pretty profitable. <laughs> so, sounds expensive. I mean, if you do a hundred deals, that's 20 grand, right? No, I'm talking about $200 a month. That's it. You don't pay a transaction fee. No, no transaction fee. No hidden fees. No costs. I pay, I'm with E and O insurance. I'm twenty seven hundred dollars a month out of pocket. I'm sorry, twenty that's twenty seven hundred a year out of pocket to sell real estate. What kind of sexual favors or whatever did you do to get that kind of deal? <laughs> they, um, but uh, I think the uh, no comment the, the pleading the fifth would probably be a good idea at that point. But. Um, no, Go ahead. Okay. Well, let, let, let's dive right in here. Um, I saw both of you in the comments of that post I did where I was like, let me talk to a homeowner that agrees with the verdict or whatever. Yeah. Um, and both of you seem pretty, pretty vocal about it. Um, Nick, I'll go back to you. W what's your stance on the, you know, the current situation with the lawsuit? Yeah. The yeah. So deal? with, with the lawsuit, like the, my, my, my argument is a legal argument that price fixing has, been in, happening and price fixing doesn't have to be a, Hey, everybody is at whatever, 1500 or 25, like price fixing can be a range mm. and the majority of transactions, like oh, I, I would have to look it up, but the majority of transactions in the real estate world are in that two to 3% range for, yep. for either side. Right. So my, yep. my argument is just that, Hey, if like, I shouldn't have people that have no clue about the industry coming up to me and be saying, Hey, are you going to charge me five or six percent to list my house? Yeah, right. So that that is my my biggest gripe here is that mm -hmm. if if it's not price fixing, then I sh I should be able to charge eight and not have an issue. I should be able to charge one and a half and not have an issue. But I yeah. shouldn't have everyday people coming up to me and saying, "Hey, you're going to charge me five or six percent for this," knowing, "Hey, this is this is the standard or this is what quote everybody charges." Well, I think uh, I think you can charge anything you want. You could charge one, you could charge eight, you could charge anything you want. But I guess the question is, isn't every industry kind of work in a range? I mean, there's a range that roofers charge to roof a house. There's a range that lawyers charge to, you know, sue the hell out of big um, companies and give homeowners two thousand bucks while they get billions. Uh, there's a range for just about everything. So how I guess my question is, how does it differ from any other industry? Because there's because I can get a different roof, I can get a different countertop, I can get a different car, right? Mm -hmm. And your car dealers are going to get a different range based on each car, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's actually a different range. The the only difference in the real estate world is anything that's two and a half, like anything that's less than two and a half percent, is probably going to sit on the MLS for however long, mm -hmm. right? The the number was seventy five percent of transactions that were two and a half percent or less didn't never sold. 
on, on the buy side, right? So knowing that if I know I have to be as a seller, if I know I have to be at a 275 or a three or a 325 to get this done, it, it's essentially forcing me to use an MLS or use something else mm-hmm. where I know I'm going to get the the marketing and everything else that goes into it. I, I don't yeah. think, I think, it, I think by 20, I think by 2030, I, I don't think the real estate agent exists anymore. Mm-hmm. I think, I think we're clicking the same way we, we click and buy floors or the same way we click and buy anything else. Because if you are remotely smart as a homeowner, you take some decent pictures, you get it up on a Zillow or a Redfin or a realtor. I, th- I think we're clicking three or four buttons and it's going to a title company or it's going to your lawyer. What do you think the difference is in 2030 and now? Cause people can make a couple clicks and sell a property on their own. Now. Right. I, I, th- I think we're still waiting on, I think we're waiting on adoption for the older generation. Is, is is what I think because it's the the way that especially with a bunch of those homes in, in the, your older generation like a bunch of those are going to need to be sold and I don't I don't see them adopting the tech mm-hmm. as quickly as somebody at, at my age or or younger yeah. where hey I just want to click three buttons and now this is done and it's o- over with I think they're still going to have to talk to somebody because it's the way they've always done business mm-hmm. I think we're we're fighting a just a personal side, a personal preference thing versus an actual, like I, st- I still think there's an industry problem, but I think we're fighting personal preference on the adoption yeah. side. What do you think? And, and, you know, I'm not, I don't argue that that could happen. Um, yeah. What do you, what do you think the process is, especially for existing homes, even, even new construction, there's problems, right? Right. Um, I just bought, um, five new construction homes and they all had problems. Uh, we actually yeah. had to tear up. We had to completely demolish the driveway. They had to bring a, a, um, you know, like a, a Bobcat or whatever in to, to tear up the driveway. Cause it was, it was messed up and I wasn't, I wasn't going to buy the house. I was like, right. I'm, not, I'm not going to buy that. You know, yeah. just sell me another one that you're building right next door. I'm not going to buy that one. Yeah. If, if you're not going to fix that and they're like, okay, we'll fix it. So they actually tore it up and re poured the driveway and did it right on two sure. of the, two of the homes. Okay. Um, you know, there's always stuff, even if it's a brand new home. And when you get into these older existing homes, there's a lot of stuff, right? Right. So how do you think the buyers become protected, um, you know, in those scenarios where real sure. estate agents don't exist, not to say a lawyer couldn't do some kind of liability thing, not to say, I think in those scenarios, there's going to be new insurance uh, right. industries, sure. right? New policies that are invented. And these, yep. these actually exist in other countries. And right. by the way, the other countries where there's no buyer agent really involved, there there are, it's also a range. It's like two to 3% or one and a half to three. Uh, all right. everything is ranges. Right. I don't I don't I don't I don't get the argument that like it's price fixing if there's like a range that people are familiar with. But what do you, how do you think in that world in 2030 people kind of protect themselves, especially like first time home buyers that know nothing sure. about what they're doing? Sure. I so I think you're I think you're right. I think your insurances are going to pop up differently. I think you're still going to have your warranties. Right? You're still going to be able to purchase your warranty. You can purchase a warranty right now without an agent. Right. But I, th- I think you see flat rates if you want to bring somebody else in. If you want somebody that's not a lawyer or a title person and you just want somebody that's real estate expert or whatever we're calling them by that point. I think you bring them in and you give them whatever a flat rate is that they decide based on home value or based on their expertise versus what the home purchase price is worth. Because the even even industry wide right now as a six. Right. Say say we get a six percent listing. The assumption is that I'm as good an agent as Ricky, as Joel, as whoever else comes along. And that's and that's what you're getting paid, right? I'm not paying it on the agent side right now. I'm not paying based on expertise or how good you are at your job. I'm paying based on percentage of home. And there are plenty of agents right now that just fill out paperwork and don't provide a whole bunch of value. And then the transaction happens. So where do you think, do you think the responsibility lies on the consumer? to actually scout out a good agent because uh, 71% I think of buyers and 85% of sellers went with the very first agent they talked to. They didn't even get a second opinion on one of the largest financial decisions that they're going to make in the next 10 years. Um, Why, why are people not getting a second opinion uh, or even a third or a fourth or a fifth 
to make sure that they feel like this is a very competent agent that has high integrity, that has experience that they want. At what point, where, where is the, the line drawn on responsibility of the customer to, to actually, I mean, cause, cause let's face it, there, there, there are bad agents out there, 100%. right? And there's a lot of amazing agents out there, right? right? Yeah. And so, you know, just because the consumer doesn't go get a second opinion and chooses to go with the first agent they talk to, which could be a bad agent or a good agent, let's roll the dice. Right. Right. I right. mean, where, where's that? Where's the responsibility on their side for this? I, th right? I think I think it's all on their side. Right. So and that's where especially on the, the lawsuit side of things where they're going after. I have no problem with you going after NAR. I have no problem with you going after NAR. I have a problem with you going after smaller teams. Right. And like the, the fact that th this new one has a bunch of smaller teams that are involved makes zero sense. Right. That That's on the consumer. Just like which just like, which, which one. The, so uh, I would have to pull it up. There, there, there's a newer one that names two or three different smaller teams. Is that in, one? In the, is that one in the where is that one out? Is that the one in Do Texas? You know? I, I, I don't know. I is don't know. Where it's in at. Texas, Joel. Is that the one in Texas? I think they just named they just had another lawsuit. Uh, filed yesterday, maybe day before. Yeah. yeah. So, well, but well, bottom line, before I go to Joel for a second, sure. then I want to kind of go back and forth. Yeah. As far as the verdict goes, like you, you support the, the verdict, like um, that these like brokerages basically with an R conspired to inflate commissions. Yes. Yes. Got you. Yes. And I, I, so, and then can I, can I go back yeah. real quick to the, the interviewing agents? Right. So yeah. just like if I got, di if, God forbid, I get diagnosed with something from a doctor, like you best believe we're going to two or three other ones and we're figuring out who, who the best doctor is in the world for these two or three things or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Right. So just, so as a consumer, it is the biggest purchase or biggest sale of your life. I don't understand why people aren't interviewing two or three different agents in the area, maybe four, and figuring out, hey, who are the actual best people you know versus, hey, you were first on the Google machine or you were first on whatever I searched. Okay, cool. So we're going to go with you. Yeah. I, I, th I think a bunch of that's on the consumer. It's it's a massive problem, yeah. right? And, and, and like that's a big part of, I think, what's hurting the whole situation in the public eye is that the consumers are doing a horrible job of vetting the agents that they're working with. Right. Um, and I don't know where that comes from necessarily because like, I don't know what the stats are when you get your house roofed or build a house or, um, you know, pick a landscaper or a dentist. I don't know the numbers, right? The stats right. on like, do people pick the first, you know, landscaper or painter or dentist that they talk to? Um, but that just seems ridiculous to me how consumers don't get a second opinion. Joel, give me your thoughts on the overall, um, like, uh, lawsuit, the verdict, like what's your stance and perspective? Uh, first of all, I think the, uh, the, the legal system is based on a concept that you're innocent until proven guilty. And I, mm -hmm. I don't think that this, this industry has been proven guilty of price fixing. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be almost impossible to prove that they're guilty of price fixing. And because every transaction is different and every seller and every buyer has the right to, to negotiate commissions, every single one of them. Yeah. And, you know, we, we make recommendations on what commissions could be and we make recommendations on, you know, but I, uh, every listing presentation I've been on and I'm more on the listing side has been with the, with the sellers to say, you have the right to choose however much you want to pay for commission. I think the problem is, is that a lot of agents don't do that. Right. And they should, I mean, it's part of, you know, it's part of your job is that you should you know, the, give the option. You, you have the option. I think that the, the, what happened is we forgot that the buyer is the one that provides the money to buy the house. Uh -huh. The buyer is providing the money for the commissions. Right. Which is kind of part of the problem, right? Because right. what so, their argument is, is buyer commissions that they don't get to negotiate inflate home prices. Well, they do negotiate. They, it's the buyer's commission is set by the seller. Yeah, the seller has the right to to negotiate that commission. Buyer, the one bringing the money that's paying for the house and ultimately deciding the purchase price, doesn't get right. to negotiate their commission. Um, therefore, inflating right. home prices. That's the argument. Mm -hmm. 
that the buyer that the buyers doesn't get to set the commission. The buyer doesn't get to negotiate the commission that their agent is getting, mm -hmm. therefore inflating home prices. You know, there's a home buyer lawsuit. Um, right. So as soon as the Sitzer Burnett got the verdict came out, then you know, of course, there was like 10 more lawsuits that were filed the next day. But like one of them was home buyers who said, wait a minute, we're not even the sellers get to negotiate uh, what our agent's going to get. That's not right. They're our agent. Right. And so that it, it kind of brings me to um, it's like, OK, it sounds like people for, for one thing for me, guys, honestly, this is to me just the biggest money grab in history in the real estate industry. Number one. Both arguments are silly, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but for the buyers, it's like, well, OK, so you want to negotiate your own commission. OK, but do you want it figured into the price or you want to pay out of your pocket? Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it's like, OK, you're wanting to have your cake and eat it, too. Do you want it figured into the price and, and you get to negotiate? Right. Or do you just want to buy the house for what you're willing to pay for the house? It's like that. That's the other part of the argument for me. The buyers negotiate not based on what the commission is. They 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 they, they negotiate and pay what they're willing to pay without even a commission even being part of their negotiations. So what does it matter? It's figured into what they're they, you know, they're willing to pay for the house, and now they want to. And so what will happen on the opposite, the contrary is they negotiate what they're willing to pay for the house and then pay a commission on top of that. That's what you want because that see, see for me, that's what inflates home prices is if you pay what the price, the retail price, which is what people are going to pay, no matter what happens with this retail is going to stay retail. This isn't going to fluctuate home prices. And then you're going to pay an, another, you're going to pay a commission on top of that. So you're actually paying more for the house than you are right now. Yeah. Right. That's my argument with buyers paying their own fees is that prices aren't going to go down. Sellers aren't going to take 3% less than retail because they're not paying a buyer agent commission. Right. Right. Um, and I yeah. think that this will actually increase the cost of, of housing. Um, at the, at the end of the day, they were paying for it already anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. So if, if, if they're looking at, cause when you're looking at the settlement sheet, right. If you're just looking at it and you're like, Hey, why is this, what commission's the one thing they're going to go to, right. Cause it's the, the quote only thing they think they can negotiate. So if I took that out, we negotiate everything else. The majority of buyers commissions are paid through the loan right now. Yeah. They're not paid through, they're, they're not paid through proceeds of the house. They're not paid through, like they are paid through the, the, the money at the bottom of the sheet where you're like, what needs to go where to make all this work, right? So I, th I think that portion of the what needs to go where to make this work is, I, I guess, unclear for the consumer. We're cool. Okay, let's just take all that out and you give me whatever, a flat 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 outside of this. Problem is people don't have that money usually to be like, here, Ricky, here's your, here's your 17,000 for this home that you just got this done on. Right. It's inside of it's all inside of the transaction. So I think everything being inside of the transaction is the issue that is in question here mm. versus if it was just a, hey, if I if I went to a local coffee shop and I gave them ten dollars in cash versus ten dollars in a card. Right. I'm going to pay more with, with the card. So am I going to pay more inside the transaction with the buyer's agent right now or is that something I'm just going to pay cash? And hey, here you go. You, you you do whatever you need to do inside of there. I understand mm -hmm. that that's not exactly how it works, but from a transaction standpoint, if you pulled that out of the actual settlement and you said, "Hey, here here's what I'm charging. I need ten thousand dollars," I think that person goes away and they and the buyer figures it out on their own, or or they're talking to somebody else. But I don't think anybody's going to come out of pocket to pay a buyer's agent moving forward. Oh, I don't either. Well, I think some people would. Um, we've even had a lot of, uh, emails and comments and stuff like that from buyers who are like, I'm happy to pay, you know, my buyer's agent. If that's what it comes down to, I'm never going to do a deal without someone yeah. representing me, okay. um, wealthier people, right. People that have the money. And, th and that, that's another part of the problem too. You, you wipe this out and now you're kind of, it's coming, it's, it's kind of like now we're picking on, you know, the lower class, the middle class, the people that like scrape up to get to the down payment. And now they have to go unrepresented. Right. Um, so that that's like the puzzle that you got to figure out for the 2030 industry is how do we protect those people? 
right? Where, where's right. the protection going to lie for those people? Go ahead, Joel. Somebody's going to take advantage of that business opportunity in that niche and, and create a program that, that works for them. I think they already have. There's a lot of startups right now that right. are happy. If you um, search around and read some articles, there's a lot of startups that are focused on buyers and, um, you know, um, doing things differently and innovative ways to work with buyers and stuff. So that that's already happening. There's already startups that work directly with buyers and, you know, help them. And, you know, it's like one and a half percent here and, you know, it's cheaper kind of stuff. There'll definitely be some disruptions when it comes to all this. Right. You know, my point in the, in the what I wrote to you, Ricky, was that what other industry does the seller pay the buyer's commission or the buyer's agent to nego negotiate against them? Uh huh. Right. And so in, from that side, from the seller side to the buyer side, I can understand the argument that I don't want to pay somebody else's commission. But I also want. Well, it, to it comes back to the have your cake and eat it, too, kind of deal. Exactly. Right. Right. You don't you don't want to pay the buyer agent commission because they're negotiating against you, but you want all four thousand agents in your area to be working hard to sell your home for the highest price. Right. Right. So it's like, what yeah. you know, OK, you take this away, then you don't get this. Right. right. And so you have to decide, OK, pros and cons. OK, what side of the fence am I on? It's almost like a it's almost like politics. Like it's like you're on the right or left here. Like it's like you you want you know, that that's kind of how this is kind of starting to play out. It's like people are on one side of the fence or the other. Do we have, do we see a, a time moving forward where dual agent, like I have a dual agency clause everywhere and everybody does it. Do what now? Do, do, do we see a time moving forward where dual age, like they would obviously have to change some of it, but where dual agency would be the only thing. Hey, hey, I'm no. going to take this at whatever percentage and I'm going to sit here. No, because there's a lot there's a lot of states that don't allow dual agency. Right. So, so number one, state by state, see, state by state would have to kind of like there would be different rules state by state. Number one. Sure. Um, and so if something massive happened, we're still waiting on the judge to rule. Right. Is there going to be right. an injunction? Are they going to actually change the way we do business with a snap of a finger until appeals go through, which could take years? Right. Um, that could happen any day. We're waiting to kind of see what, what happens, but, um, but with dual agency, it's different for every state. Some states don't allow it. So if something, if, if something happens injunction wise, and then certain states that don't allow it may allow it, who knows right. what'll kind of happen there. Or like the states that don't allow it, they allow you to work with the buyer as a transaction broker, where it's basically arm length. You can't, you can't work on their best interest. You're, you're, you're basically working with them, but not for them. Right. Like right. You're a referee essentially for the seller. Right. And you're trying to get the highest price there. And th this is the, this is the problem, right? Yeah. You're working for the seller to get them the highest price, but you're not trying, you don't have a fiduciary to the buyers and you're basically tell you you can't advise them. So it's like, okay, seller, here's what the buyers are offering. You know, I would do this. Okay. Counter. Great. Go back to the buyer and say, here's the counter. What do you want to do? Well, what do you think we should do? I can't tell you. Can't I can't say because I represent you as a transaction broker. You right. tell me what you want to do. I go back to the seller. Go back to the seller and say, here's what the buyers say to that. Here's what I would do. And so that's what it turns into with these non-dual agency. And then when you get in a dual agency where you have a fiduciary of both sides, well, isn't that a sticky situation, right? Right. As right. a real estate agent, now you just increase your liability 10 times over. Correct. Right. And so now you're in a really weird spot because you're trying to fiduciarily help everyone. So that that gets a little sticky. Um, but no, I don't think it'll ever get to a place where like one agent handles the whole deal. Because sure. I think even in a world where buyers have to pay for their own representation, most of them, I, I don't know, maybe half, maybe it's not even most, maybe 50 percent or I don't know what the number will be. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent won't pay for their own representation. They'll go straight to the right. listing agent or whatever. But you'll still have a big group of people who who won't do a deal without out an agent. So I don't think there'll be a world where it's one agent doing the whole deal. Even when you get to your 2030 scenario where agents don't really exist. Sure. I think at that point, they're still going to want one person that has that fiduciary duty to make sure everything goes smooth, you know, for them one way or another. And to be honest, like right now you talked about different 
dealerships and different cars and different right. properties. I mean, we we kind of have that in in a way with the discount brokerages and the red fins and the um, the different. There's different brokerages that charge different prices. Or that's what's so funny too. You've got six percent, which is kind of like the norm, right? Sure. And then Redfin is named in the second suit that the Sitzer Burnett um, lawyer filed the day of. And Redfin is named in that suit, that second suit, when Redfin's commission is like 4%, I want to say. It's like right. 4% <laughs> right. higher. So yeah. like now you're kind of, okay, it's like price fixing, but the defendants, you've got one charging 4% and then these other traditional ones charging 6 Sure. So like, I, I guess, are you saying that since they charge four on every single deal that that's price fixing. Maybe so. I don't know what the argument is there. Right. But um, um, do we get to let, let's stay in the car world for a little bit. Right. So I can hop on to pick a website right now and find a car and I'm going to pay whatever, whatever that number is di directly. Like there's a, sure there's a dealership option. There's a direct from a seller option. Right. My, I don't have a, I don't have somebody I go to to make that. I don't have a, a third party to go make that conversation happen, right? I go buy the car. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't have somebody I can go after if I got sold. A you lemon. just click and buy, and they I deliver. Click it and buy, you. right? So and it, it does. This is not just your Carvanas, right? Like I'm, I could go meet somebody. I hand them however much money. I now have the car. Buy That's owner, all, talking right? About. Buy owner, right? That's all on me. Right? That's all on me as 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 the buyer. I don't understand why people don't take the same like the same precautions that you would with the car with a home you 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 find that first that first person that first agent you say okay cool let's go no idea whether they're good at their job but that's my, my other argument is like does that person need to be there or do i have a free marketplace where i where somebody just has a home up there and hey i could market your home better ricky i see that you have it up here as a for sale by owner i have two or three buyers that i know i could bring is that worth x amount of dollars to you and I negotiate that either outside of it or inside of it. I go. guess I guess my question is, do we know stats on how many people actually buy a buy a car by you know from directly from owner versus oh, I, like, I, I don't have I would have to I would because like look. because because recently six percent of people did buy their home buy the home directly from the owner. Right. Um, the people do do that. Um, yeah. It's just a really low percentage. I don't know how many people do that with cars. Right. Um, I'm sure it's higher because sure. it's a lower ticket item. I think the higher yeah. the ticket goes, I think the more the 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 the, the more fear people have of, of not having some kind of. I mean, a car. If you buy a bad car, it could cost you you know tens of thousands. You buy a bad house, it could cost you hundreds of thousands. Right. So right. I think it's just more risky, and that's why you know fewer people do it um, at scale. Go ahead, Joel. I think there's there. what's going to result here. There's just going to be more options for the consumer. They're going to drive more options. They're going to, um, first of all, again, I think it's going to be really difficult to, to prove collusion and price fixing in this industry, even with the kind of norm, like you said, Ricky, if you know, three, you know, five, 6%, the average person thinks is that's what the commission rate is. Um, but that's not the reality. The reality is all commissions are negotiable. Every deal is different. Uh, sell, I think sell, sell I think the right to choose what they pay a commission, and the buyer's agent and the buyer or the buyer has the right to to um, you know negotiate that commission. If they don't want to pay their buyer's agent the whatever is advertised in the MLS, I think the problem is is that there's agents that don't negotiate. Right. No. And that's what's muddying up this entire thing is that they don't explain like I have I've negotiated on probably 80 plus percent of the deals I ever did. Sure. And I even had buyers throughout my career, like back in 2012 and stuff. I had buyers like I, there was deals where I would make 20 grand and like the buyer as we're negotiating, say, take five percent, take five thousand less on the buyer agent commission. Right. And I would and right. he would get the deal for five thousand less. Right. Um, so, uh, I, but I think the problem is not every agent operates like that and they definitely haven't been trained to operate in that manner, but we've mm -hmm. kind of been trained as an industry to show your worth and don't take less than six. And like, I, 
right. have like in my coaching program, like, or one of my things is, is tell them you're be the, tell them you're the cheapest agent out there when they right. say what your commission is, say lower than anybody else's. And then that way they come back to you and you can determine, okay, do I want to take this at 4.9 or 4.4 or, or 5.5 or whatever? Or if somebody's going to do it for three, knock yourself out, have fun. Like I'm not going to take it for three or 2.9 or whatever. Um, but the market's going to be the market. I think that, I think, I think two things that's going to come out of this that are great is, is hopefully the public is being educated to some extent on the fact that they can negotiate, um, you know, commissions. And the second thing is, I think we're going to, I think the, the, the end of the day, as long as like the DOJ doesn't come out and say, you can only take $2,000 per deal or some shit, then, and, and they actually allow the market to speak. I think that'll be a really good thing. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what a lot of the uh, haters out there of agents, I think what they don't realize is that when we get a check for 30 grand, we don't get 30 grand as a 1099. You know, the W-2s, right. they get taxes taken out and they spend the entire check they get, yeah. right? We pay taxes, we pay business expenses, marketing. I mean, at the end of the day, like, <laughs> what are we netting? 1%? It, when right. we take three, we're netting like one. Right. And that's right. what people don't get. They think, oh my God, you made 30 <laughs> grand and you literally, and, and two, it's like the faster it sells, the matter they are. Right. You right. sold, you made 30 grand and it sold in two days. It's like, did you want me to, did you want it to sit on the market for 60 days? Right. You want you're to welcome. I'm trying to get your money as fast as possible. And so now you're mad at me because you got your money so fast. I did such a good job and now you're pissed. You and and the one thing like, that I think that if we sit on the market a while, then you're, then you're pissed. It's like, I, I can't win for losing. Yeah. And the one thing they think that we control, which we don't is if there's a buyer in the market for their product at that time. Right. We don't control right. that. Right. Yeah. Well, it's also the, your, I, I've never had, I've never had a client under a certain dollar amount complain about a commission structure because they know they're paying for time and yeah. paying for a bunch of stuff that they don't want to do. Right. So that's where, if, how are you looking at this money? Are you looking at this money as, oh man, I'm losing X amount of dollars. Or are you looking at this money as, Hey, I'll pay, I'll pay Ricky. I'm, it's a $3 million house. Ricky, here's forty thousand dollars. Do whatever you need to do. I, I need this gone, and I don't want to have to deal with it because I have nineteen other things that I'm doing. Right. So the the more that we as agents portray that that you're not you're not just paying for me, right? You're paying for the you're paying for your quality of life while this is listed, and to have the least stress inside of a transaction you can have. That's why you pay me, mm -hmm. right? And the more that is actually brought out and said, hey, here's what I'm actually doing to get this going, and yeah, we're glad you got under contract in forty eight hours. The, the, I think the easier it becomes, but I, I don't know that they're inside of either the buy side or the sell side, that that's happening a whole lot. Yeah. I think yeah. we're just looking at it as a dollar amount versus everything else that's going into it and the time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to disagree with Nick. I think there will be agents in 2030. I think if you look at the travel agency business that, you know, I can go online now and book everything I need to book for it to, but, or I could go to a travel agent. I'm going to go to Iceland next year. I could go and do all that research and do everything by myself. Or I could go hire an agent, a travel agent who knows all of those niches and, and, and ideas and places to visit and pay them a little bit of money to help me schedule when it. You, when you so compare it, there will still be agents. But I think that the options that are going to be available to the consumer as a result of this lawsuit are going to be greater options for how commissions are going to be paid. And, that, and that's a good thing for the consumer. When you compare it to travel agents there's way less travel agents now than there right. were and they make a lot less. Yeah. And so same, we're making that comparison, huh? Same thing's going to happen to buyer agents. All right. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, what about uh, listing agents? As my coffee cup says, let the adventure begin. What, what about listing agents? Listing agents, uh, again, the listing agent in the presentation and how the, you know, we're going to have to train out the, um, real estate agents is that every transaction is negotiable. Every commission is negotiable. And it, play, it, the seller, as, the, as the next generation gets older and startups and technology gets better, it's going to be so easy for a seller to just click, click, boom, and advertise their home. Sure. And there's I'm, I'm just looking for the argument of why people will 
listen. You know, you know what I think actually. I think there'll be more buyers agents than listing agents in 2030. Honestly, I think because because I, I think people can list their properties on their own a lot easier in 2030. But the buyers are going to be the ones that need the, you know, the the help, the consultation, the uh, the protection uh, and stuff. You know what I mean? Well, the both sides do. Well, they, they, they really do. They really do. I mean, I don't like now, now here, now here's something that's really messed up. The, the whole for sale by owners make less thing. Um, now I've dug deep into that and I found a lot of research and what, and what I've come up with is that this number that they make less is kind of ba is kind of skewed based on the fact that higher end people use more agents than lower end properties um but then when you compare apples to apples the for sale by owners get about the same uh with or without an agent um and i i was very disturbed about that because i've always been shown the data where agent where an agent makes you more than uh as a for sale by owner um and so that was disturbing for me because I felt misled by the entire industry. Um, and then I, then I felt, I, I felt manipulated. Like I was brainwashed to, I was programmed to think that agents get people more money um, in order to say, well, this is why we're worth it uh, for us to use us. I, I don't think price is the reason this is the value that, 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 agents have for sellers. I think the value is taking care of the prop, taking care of the, the deal for them, right? Yeah. Through people backing out of deals and all the other like terms that are negotiated in the contract and kind of knowing when you're dealing with uh, a bad buyer or not and um, things of that nature. Knowledge sure. experience. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's also the when pick your Zillow, Redfin, Realtor.com, right? Initially, your 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 Zestimate was could, could be within a, a 40% range. Yeah. Right. Of, of what the home's actually worth. And here recently, yeah. just looking at comps I've run and then looking at the three or four numbers across the websites, mm -hmm. that we're within one or two percent now. We're, we're, I, don't, I don't have this this giant range of everything. Mm. Right. So the the comps, the does it make sense, the the every the, the expertise, if there was if there was a calculator on one of those websites that the whole industry agreed was, hey, this was accurate. You, you only need me for paperwork and a couple negotiations now on the list side. Right. Mm. Because on the list side, you draw your circle and you say, hey, OK, go. Um, Ricky, I, I like the, hey, there, there might be more on the buy side, depending on how informed that seller is moving forward. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I want I want to say that, uh, I want to say that by 2030, we'll just have a lot less agents, right. um, but very high quality agents. 100%. I think we'll have better agents. Um you know, more disclosing more about the process, right? Um, making less per transaction, but doing way less work than we were. Right. Well, I also think you're way more hyper and not that people aren't doing it now, you're good ones, but I think you have a way smaller community and niche that you're in right now versus saying, Hey, I'm your, whatever, your South Florida real estate agent and I'll handle anything from whatever Fort Lauderdale all the way down to South beach. Like, no, you won't. <laughs> No, you will. You, you will be the the South Beach waterfront condo agent because that's what you did. Or you will be the the residential middle of middle of America agent in subdivisions because that's where your expertise is. And I think you're, we're going to pay a lot if if they're still out there. I think you're paying a lot more on the expertise side versus somebody that's just getting you through the transaction doing paperwork. So what are you saying exactly? There's going to be, as time goes on, you're going to have more niche. I think agents. you're going to have better agents that are very specific in what they do. Mm. And not that that doesn't exist now, but just like your travel agent world has shrunk. I don't know what the number is, but has shrunk exponentially. I think the, the real estate agent world shrinks exponentially because all of your part-time agents aren't 
aren't going to be able to show the value that 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 other person is that they're competing against if they're competing. I think that uh, I think that this process of listing presentations where you have the tiered commission structure where it's like, you know, you know, 3% for this, 4% for this, 6% for this, 7% for that. I was never a big fan of that. I gave everybody the highest quality serve, like the highest form of everything I could do. Sure. I did it regardless if, uh, if they were paying me four and a half or six and a half, it didn't really matter. I gave them the highest service period. Sure. But in this new world, right. Where there's going to have, where they're going to have more options that right. almost makes a lot of sense. Like I'm an agent. Like if you just want me to handle the paperwork for you and like, make sure you're good and negotiate, then it's 3% and I'll just charge you 3%, nothing to the buyer. Right. Or 2% or whatever. Right. If, if you want me to actually advertise and handle showings and everything, then it's 4%. It, you know, if you want me to, and then I think this, I think this tiered, like the way that some of these coaches and stuff have laid that out, I think that's going to become more prevalent uh, in the new world. And I'm excited about that because it's going to give people options because not everybody's going to want the same thing. This seller is going to be like, all I need is somebody to make sure I don't get screwed on the paperwork. Okay, great. Two and a half percent done. Right. And the next seller is like, I don't want to even think about this. I don't want to talk to buyers. I don't want to see anybody. I just need you to handle the full service. Okay. It's, you know, 5% for that or whatever. Right. right. I think that's what we're going to kind of get, get into. Um, and I hope that I hope that we're living in a world where the seller gets to choose if the buyer agent is paid from the listing from, from the commission that they negotiate with the seller. I hope that doesn't get outlawed so that it's just the seller's choice to do that or not. Right. If they don't want to fine. Right. But if they do, you know, hopefully they will be in a world where they can, if they want to. Right. Go ahead, Joel. Right. Absolutely. Cool. Did you have anything to add to that, Joel? No, I think that's the, that's the whole gist of this lawsuit is that there needs to be more, more choices for the consumer. And, well, and I got to admit, man, I had my boxing gloves on with you guys. I, I, I was thinking this was going to be a lot more heated than this. This <laughs> has been a very kumbaya type situation. <laughs> it's, it's, and, uh, th th this is this is a conversation, Ricky, versus the soundbite where you're ang uh, we're, we're going to say angrier than you should be. I, I think angrier than you should be on the post. And then I, all I saw was like a bunch of yeses and a bunch of people that were agree on the and post like, that you commented on yeah yeah i, I saw oh. a bunch i saw a bunch of people that were agreeing and i was like hang on a second i was like here's here's my actual thought in whatever the paragraph that i sent out um but no at the at the end of the day this is i i think if we take it outside of the transaction if, if we if we take buyers payment outside of the transaction i i think this whole thing goes away right i also think i think, that if, we make, I think if we make it a clear-cut choice right. for the seller right to right. include it or exclude it yeah. right and you um, should be doing that now on the list side if you're not if you weren't doing that now that's on you as the agent but like that that was always an option if that's not how it was presented then i'm all, all on board with the lawsuit well here here's the thing that gets me is that the seller and uh, the plaintiffs were okay paying let's just say five percent sure okay they're okay paying the five percent regardless if there's a buyer agent involved or not Right. So, right. so they're, pay, they're going to pay the listing agent 5% if they represented the buyer or if they brought the buyer as a transaction broker or whatever. They're, they're okay with their net number paying 5%. And it's like, well, okay, you're still just paying 5%. Why is it that just because a buyer agent's involved and I'm not getting all the 5% that now you're mad at me and my brokerage? Right. Right. right? right. That's my, that's the silly side of this for me is that you were happy paying sure. me the whole 5% if I brought the buyer. Why are you unhappy that I used part of the money you just, you, you agreed to pay for me to get the job done to entice uh, you know thousands of agents to help me sell this thing for top dollar? Right. That's well, my argument to the plaintiff. Well, sure, sure. Were you, my, my question there is, are you bitching to your client that you're losing some of your commission to the buy side now? Because if that's what steamrolled this if that's what got this whole thing rolling then that's on us as agents if not i understand both sides but like 
if you said, oh, man, I'm only going to get 3% now because they brought somebody else, like that's on you as the agent. And that's not something you're whining to your client about. Right. No, it's, it's, it's the, the money's there to, to find a buyer, whether the listing agent finds the buyer or the buyer's agent finds the buyer. The money's there from the seller to find a buyer. Correct. Out it, you don't have any trans. You don't have a transaction, Ricky. I would like to say that I wish that you were in that courtroom. Absolutely. I was, I was in the courtroom <laughs> for this argument for for NAR that we are doing exactly what we should be doing, which is providing competitive services. We're providing knowledge and information and training, and and everything. Here's, here's my bottom line on the whole thing. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> The whole thing is is for, for not the verdict because I think the verdict is bullshit, yeah. and I think the whole thing's a scam, right? I think the whole thing is a money grab, and that's why all the why are all these lawsuits popping up now that there's a verdict? Why weren't they already popping up? Right? It's yeah. it's, it's a scam, right? It's not as and, the, and the weird thing is the lawyer is suing somebody for what he's doing while he's suing them, right? Right? The same thing. The owners get two thousand bucks and he gets five hundred million. 100%. Um, and, 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 and now I'm not going to sound like one of the consumers talking about agents. Cause I know he doesn't get 500 million. He has to pay taxes. He has to pay expenses, blah, blah, blah. I get it. Maybe he ends up with a cool hundred mil. Okay. Poor him. Yeah. But my thing is on the, the, on the actual trials scams on the actual issue, I'm kind of in the middle, sure. right? I'm really in the middle. I'm not really right or left. I'm, I'm, I, I, I actually love, I actually would love for this to get to a place where let the market speak, let everyone make their own decisions, let technology and the next generation come up, let everybody make their own decisions on how they want to operate buying or selling, you know, give everybody the op, all the options available and let them pick what they want to do. I think it'll weed out a lot of agents, which will be a good thing because the ones that are left are going to be the good ones. And I think it'll make the industry stronger overall. I think there'll be more market share per agent because, you know, a lot of them will leave. I think this is great. Honestly, it's going to clean out the industry, which people have talked shit for so long about it with the, you know, bad agents and blah, 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 and the low barrier of entry and stuff like that. Um, so I'm excited about the issue at hand and i want it to be worked out fairly for everyone which means transparency and options for everyone but as far as these trials and lawsuits and shit go they are scams and yeah, that's what pisses me off about this whole thing what's the what's the average uh gross commission income for an agent in this country is like forty thousand dollars right that's before tax 50, 55 55 that's before yeah. tax so you take a third of that but out. You gotta think that, but but you, but what you but but what you have to understand though, Joel, about that is that we are manipulated, right? That's figuring in every agent, and you know, eighty percent of them don't sell anything. So really, the top twenty percent are really the ones that you know. Okay, multiply fifty five thousand times one point six or whatever, right? And that's how much, you know, what is that? A hundred mil, right? Cause like, it's like a hundred, I mean, a hundred bill, like yeah. it's, it's supposed to be like a hundred bill, like 70 bill, 80 bills, what the commission pool is. Okay. Now you divide, you, you divide that by 20% of ages, not a hundred percent. And that, and that dude, this right here is where I start to get disturbed when, when I'm getting told that for sale by owners sell for less money, when I'm being told that. Oh, agents make 55,000. No, they don't. They make a lot more than 55,000. Right. The ones there's, but there's agents that don't make anything. <laughs> right. And right. then, tw so, 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 okay, let's do the numbers. Yeah. I'm going to do the numbers real quick. Well, North Carolina, it was, uh, I, I forget the numbers, but when, when you did it all out, it was less than, less than one transaction per agent with the number of, number of people they had in the industry when I was getting into it. See, okay. Let's just say 80 billion. Okay, and then twenty percent of one point five, let's say, because it's about one point five million right now. That's three hundred thousand. Okay, that's two hundred and sixty-six thousand dollars per agent. And maybe it's let's just let's say let's say seventy percent. Let's see, that'd be four hundred fifty thousand agents. That's one hundred and seventy-seven. Even if you split it in half, well, let let's do this. Let's say one point six. See, there you go, dude. There you go. 
If you divide the 80, 80 billion by 1.6, that's 50,000. So that's where they got their number right. from. They right. took the entire commission pool, divided it by total number of agents. That is misleading. That right. is that is manipulating, bro, to, to me. Because now you talk to the general public and say, well, we make 55,000. Okay, I'm making a million a year and I don't even I'm not even in the business anymore. You just made 45 on one transaction. There's no way you're making 55. Now, right. but when you figure in the 80% of agents that don't do anything, okay. Correct. Right. Okay. Well, they do the one. They, they do the one or two all year, and that's it. They're either going to get out of the business, right. or they're going to become one of the superstars that make an average of one hundred and fifty thousand a year. Let's just say, right. Yeah. So this is where I feel like, as agents, we've been taken advantage of in terms of manipulated by the system. I'm starting to feel that way. And for so long, I didn't. I believed all the stats. I believed for sale by owner, sell for less. I believed all this stuff. Right. And now I'm like, wait a minute. Have I been, I've been fooled, dude. I've been tricked. And so now I'm like, okay, I understand the game now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Ricky, do you it's think it turns into more on the training side? Is that going to be more at the raising the barrier for entry or is that going to be more on individual brokerages? From a let's just call it a compliance state. compliance issue. I think it'll be state per state. Per state? Okay. I think it'll be I don't think the bear of entry is gonna change, although it could. Uh, I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is disclosure to consumers. Right. And I think on a state level that they're gonna have to put in laws that that say you have to show this document right here. And you Which have to make sure. states. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, but 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 this new document, okay, is going to actually spell out what their all their options. And you know, the brokerages are okay. probably going to come out with their own disclosures too. Sure. That says, hey, just so you know, you can list by owner if you want to, right? The I think I think the disclosure is going to say that, hey, your option here is list by owner without an agent. That's your option by by law that is uh your right to for sale by owner you know here's your next option right you can elect to pay the buyer agent commission or not right here's the next option and i think it's going to go down the line where you literally have to you know go through that document with every client um so that they understand everything about it Right. I think that's really where it lies. And then as the industry changes with technology and new generations, I think that will weed out the, the part-timers. We'll see. I, th I think you're spot on. And we, you know, we've got an agency disclosure form we already use with the first material contact about buying or selling real estate. You know, that mm -hmm. form is required to, to be signed by the, by the client. I think the problem is agents don't go over it. And it isn't as clear on like, I'm sure it doesn't say, hey, do you know you can sell this by owner and not pay a commission? Right. I think that needs to be stated somewhere in paperwork so that people know. Because part of the argument I hear in the comments is I'm like, well, 90% of people use an agent because they want to, not because they have to. It's by choice. And then people comment. They're like, well, that's because they don't know they can do it on their own. Right. Well, first off, it's like. Well, okay, you, you're going to sell a house for, you know, a half a million bucks. You're not even going to Google, like, what are my options, right? Number one. Number two, you're going with the first agent you talk to. So, again, a lot of this lies on the consumer responsibility, in my opinion. But I think that's where we as an industry have to step up. to. Ed we have to realize that we, we assume consumers know, what, know a little bit about what they're doing when they don't. Right. I think that's part of the problem. We walk into every appointment with a buyer or seller, assuming that they know more than they do. And we just kind of go through the transaction real fast because we're the expert and it's like breathing air to us. It's not even, you know, like we do this in our sleep. So it's like, we don't even realize how much we actually know more than the general public. So we're just breezing through the transaction. Right. But then I think we need to slow it down a little bit, you know, just to make sure that they understand that way. And again, dude, I think we're, we're always going to live in a world where you can't make everybody happy. And there's always going to be people, no matter what you do, that just hate, hate on people and sue people and, you know, say that you did them wrong, even though you've been over backwards. But, um, but again, 
I'm excited about yeah. whatever changes come out of this and I'm looking for opportunities to expand and I'll be on the front end of whatever wave happens. If we end up with 300,000 total agents in the U S by 2030, I'm going to be running a hundred thousand of them. Right. <laughs> right. I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be running a team of a hundred thousand of those. Right. So cool. Hey, I appreciate you guys coming on and, and sharing your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I-35 with the top down. Quit to tell a hater they should get like me.